baseball team's on the way to Texas. We actually have five players in here. So we finished up 1-5, or no, 1-3 the last time on linear equations, and then also looked at 1-4. So questions from 1-3? Yes. 29. 29. So find the point at which the line f of x equals negative 2x minus 1 intersects the line g of x equals <coughs> negative x. So we've got two lines. Normally we'd probably put it y equals negative 2x minus 1 and y equals negative x. And we want to figure out the point that's on both lines. Since we've got y equal in both cases, if we substitute 1 into the other, we get minus x equals minus 2x minus 1, add 2x to both sides, we get x equals minus 1. Plug that in either equation. This one's an easier one to do. y equals the negative of x. y would be 1. So it's the point here, negative 1, 1, and we can double check. That does work in the second equation as well. And it is the case that there are times we're interested in where two lines uh, intersect. We call it solving the system uh, of equations. Other questions? Seven. Seven? So seven, we're given a set of information, find a linear equation that satisfies. So in seven, we're given f of negative five is negative four, <coughs> f of five is two. It's a slightly different way of saying that we're going through the points minus five, four, and five, two. We're given the input and the output. So we need a line that goes through those two points. Slope of that line, change in y over change in x, 2 minus 4 over 5 minus a minus 5, negative 2 over 10, or negative 1 fifth. Basic form y equals b plus mx. We could use either of these two points, y is 2. When x is 5, did I make a mistake somewhere? I think that should be negative 4, right? Oh, yeah, th this sh yeah, should be negative 4. Thank you. So, 2 minus, I'll pull out my red pen to make corrections. 2 minus a negative 4, so that should be 6. And so we've got 3 fifths for the slope. So we can still plug in the information at this point was correct, but now that I've got the slope right, we can continue to work with this. So let's see, 2 equals b plus 3. b then is minus 1. So our equation here is y equals minus 1 plus 3 fifths x. And we could double check when x is 5. We do get y equals 2 when x is minus 5. Uh, we do get minus 4. And the mistake I made would be yet another reason to show all your work. I mean, if you make that mistake, you just drop a negative in copying the problem. Could have done all the work correctly, but your answer is not really going to look like anything that was expected because of one simple mistake. But simple mistakes creep in all the time. And in a sense, the, the, the more we rely on technology, the easier it is for that to happen. You, you type something into a spreadsheet. Well, if you put the wrong number in there, the spreadsheet will do exactly what you told it to do, but if the wrong number's in there, you're not going to get the right results. Or if you put in a formula and, and you get a typo in the formula, it, unless it doesn't recognize the formula at all, it will still do something, exactly what you ask it to do, but you didn't really ask it what you thought because you have an error in the formula. So you definitely have to kind of watch and, and be extra careful as you use technology to be sure it really is doing exactly what you want it to do 
because it'll do exactly what you ask it to do. And if you put any kind of mistake in, you know, your, your, your work will be wrong, or your final result will be wrong, even if all your work is correct, you know, one little mistake will mess everything up. Okay. Other questions? 31. 31. A car rental company offers two plans for renting a car. Plan A and Plan B. Let's see. In Plan A, we charge $30 a day and 18 cents uh, per mile. So we're looking for what would be the charge in a day? How many miles would you need to drive uh, in, in one day for plan B to save you money? Because plan B costs more up front. So plan B, $50 a day, but unlimited mileage. <coughs> so this equation is fairly straightforward. The cost is $50. <coughs> doesn't matter how many miles you drive, there, there's no charge for additional miles. Whereas this one, the cost is $30 plus 18 cents per mile. So we'll call it X the miles driven. And so again, we're, we've got two equations. We want to find out well, what value solves them both. Now, this equation is a little different in that we don't see X in there. It's just a constant. So if we substitute, we need to figure out, well, when does this cost? actually gets to $50. So subtract 30 from both sides. 20 equals 0.18x. x would be 20 divided by 0.18. And in this one's a case, we, we definitely have to watch our units. We've got dollars and we've got cents. We need to make sure we get everything in the same units. And let's see, 20 divided by 0.18. For that, I definitely want to just pull out a calculator. still be a little cheaper. At 112, this becomes cheaper. Uh, the problem's not really descriptive enough if you pay for fractions of miles. Probably they'd round up. So anything over 111 miles, they charge you for 112 anyway here, in which case it'd be cheaper to go with plan B. That'd be my guess at least. If, if they looked at fractions of miles, they'd just round up. There was one I wanted to look at. Let's see if I remember which one it was. Uh, 17. Because 17, I think, to, to me is, is a simplistic, but, but at least I think a reasonable idea of kind of how prices are arranged uh, arrived at. So a clothing business decides there's a linear relationship between the number of shirts it can sell and the price it can charge. So they, they've taken some collected some data then and found that, so let's see, the, the number of shirts, the price <coughs> we can sell, and we want price in terms of the number of shirts. So historical data shows that a thousand shirts can be sold at a price of $30, whereas if we drop the price to $22, we can sell 3,000 shirts. And it asks them to find a linear equation in the form y of P equals MN plus B. It gives the price they can charge for N shirts. So we first need to figure out the slope. 
change in output, the price drops 8. When we sell 2,000 more shirts. So, 8 over 2,000.004, or we could write that, I think it's 1 over 250 in terms of that. And so, in general, our price is minus 0.004 in plus the initial price. If we use either of these two pieces of data, when the price was 30, we sold 1,000 shirts and we could solve for B. So this 0 0.004 times $1,004. So we get the 34 equals B. And so our model here is the price equals point, negative 0.004 and plus 34. And according to that model, then, if we you know, weren't interested in selling any shirts, which makes no sense, but if we were trying to figure out at what price do we not sell any shirts, we could figure that out. If n is 0, the price would be 34. And so if we were to try to kind of graph this, just to kind of make sure we've got everything here. Let me see. I think I can graph. Here and I'll have to adjust my window considerably with the numbers we're talking about. But we started with going through the point 1,030. <coughs> so, so there's that point 1,000 shirts, $30 a shirt, and then we also had a 3,000 shirts. We could charge the price of 22. And we figured out the equation for this line is y equals 34 minus 0.004x. Uh, Put it in a different form. And you notice that line does go through the two points. So it does meet the criteria. There, there's another value I think we'd be interested in here. And that is if we just sort of gave away the shirts, so the price is zero, you know, how many shirts do we think we could just you know, give away? Well, that would be over here. We'd have to look even farther to figure out at what point is the price zero. And we could go and solve that, and it's somewhere around 8,500 shirts for that. Now, if we push this a little farther, and this is going to lead into what we'll look at today in, in section 1.5, what, what would be our, our revenue from these shirts? How, how would we figure out the revenue? Hmm? Well, that, that would be if we're looking at the product. I'm, I'm only concerned right now just how much money do we bring in? Yes, we would definitely want to be concerned about how much we're going to have to pay to produce all these shirts. But if we're starting, how much money would we bring in? I mean, how, how would we figure that out? Multiply shirts sold, how many we sell for? Yeah, the, the, the price times the number. So our revenue here would be the price times the number. And since we've got this formula for the price, we end up in this case with a formula for the revenue. If we could, you know, if we sell so many shirts, we could figure out the, the revenue. Uh, in fact, probably what we'd be more interested in would be kind of what, what price would we set this at. So maybe instead of giving the revenue in terms of how many shirts we sell, we might want to rearrange this formula. To solve for n. If I set a certain price, how many shirts could I sell, and, and substitute that in for n. But we could come up with a formula for the revenue involving just one variable. And we would like then to, to figure out, well, what price point, or in this case, we'll just follow this, what number of shirts would give us the maximum revenue? 
So if I, on this graph, put, put the revenue graph here of, let's see, so y equals negative 0.004n plus 34 times n. something wrong because oh, it doesn't want n, it wants x. Now our scale here is, is there we go, we fi finally begin to see a couple things. Notice our revenue starts out at zero. I mean if we don't sell any shirts, we're not going to make any money. If we go all the way out here to the you know, 8,500 shirts where we're just giving them away, we're not going to make any money. Somewhere in between those two extremes, we expect to make money. We're selling a positive number of shirts at a positive price, we expect to make money. And looking at this, if we get far enough here, there, there is a, a certain number of shirts produced where we would make the maximum amount of money. Now, we've nowhere included the cost of production, and, and we would want to for a more complete model, but at least in terms of kind of beginning to analyze the situation, the revenue at least ends up being what's known as a quadratic uh, curve, a parabola. And we're going to be looking to figure out where's that peak? And a couple other things about quadratics as well. But uh, th that's one of our interests is to, to pursue quadratics. And so I thought you know, pushing this a little farther to, to get us to that quadratic equation would be helpful. <clears throat> okay. Now, we also looked the last time at section 1.4 on exponents. Questions related to any of the ex exponent questions? Yep. 13. Thirteen. We've got the expression five x to the negative third over two x to the negative sixth. And we're asked here to simplify and rewrite without negative exponents. As written, the 5 is not part of the negative exponent, only the x is. And similarly, the down here, only the x is. As is often the case, as these problems are more complicated, there, there are a number of ways we could start. There's not just one way. You've got to do this first. I mean, at some point, we've got to get rid of the negative powers, negative exponents. At some point, we'll take care of the fact that we've got x's in the numerator and x's in the denominator. You can do either one first. So if we, say, deal with the negative powers first, the x to the negative third goes down in the denominator as x to the third. The x to the negative sixth in the denominator comes up as x to the sixth. And then we can combine x to a power over x to another power by subtracting the powers. So we get 5 halves x to the third. And whether we write it as 5 halves or 5x cubed over 2, that either form is fine. Whereas if we deal with simplifying here first, we've got 5x to the negative 3 minus negative 6 over 2. x to a power divided by x to another power. We could subtract the powers. Negative 3 minus a negative 6 is 3. So we get the same result either way. Um, they, they both have, I, I think, some challenges. But again, here's a good reason to kind of write and show all your work in case there's a mistake somewhere. It's easier to identify. Uh, it's also, if you go back and look, you can kind of follow what you're doing. If you just do it on your head, it's easy to get confused, especially if there were a lot more steps. Other questions from 1 4? Okay. 
So if you've got the homework ready and want to pass it up, that's fine. If you, if you need a little bit more time, it is my office by four. Should look something a little bit more 
like that if we've got it in this form. So now this one's set up, we could actually see the graph to see how I did. And so if we could get it in that form, we could look at it in terms of you know, how we shifted the quadratic. Now, there are some issues in terms of especially the, the horizontal. Did I shift it left or right? There's also a considerable uh, concern that there's actually a lot of algebra to get it in that form, just to view it as a shifted quadratic. So we're actually going to take another, another path on trying to do this other than trying to get it in that specific form. So we're going to look at analyzing the graph uh, a, a different way. And for that, it, it, um, in terms of our analysis, there's a few key features we're looking for. We definitely want to know where the vertex is. Where, where is the peak or the valley? That's a, a very key feature we're interested in figuring out. What the height is and where it's happening. Is it opening up or down? This is concave up. This is concave down. We definitely would like to know once we find the vertex. Uh, there, there is always symmetry for a parabola about a vertical line through the vertex. So if we could get a sense of what, well, if we know where the vertex is and what half the graph looks like, think of folding it over, we would know what the other half looks like. So we can save ourselves some work there, taking that into into account. Where, where do we cross the y-axis and, and where do we cross the x-axis? In, in our revenue example, we, we were interested in, I mean, we were most interested in where do we have the maximum revenue, but we'd also be interested in where would the revenue be zero. And in that case, you know, don't sell any shirts, shirts, don't charge for any of the shirts, that's where the revenue was zero. But, but those, those would be places we'd be interested in figuring out. So we're going to be looking to study parabolas at, in a way, can we figure out that information? And we're going to be starting with what's known as the standard form. So y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. So just to kind of make sure we're, we're all understanding the standard form, For y equals 3x squared minus 2x plus 1, what is our a? So our A is the 3. Whatever is times x squared, that is our A. Uh, what's B? And our B is the negative 2. Whatever is times x. And if there's a sign associated with that, that the sign's part of our, our B as well. And I think you're getting the hang of it. So in this case, C is 1. Now, there are a few times we, we might have something a little bit different. So let, let's look at this example. What would you say A is in this example? see one there, but if, if it's one, we wouldn't write it, and, and the negative indicates that as well. What about, say, B here? A 
can be is zero. We don't see the x term here. <coughs> zero x, we would not typically write it, so b is zero. When we look at quadratics, a will never be zero. If a is zero, we don't have a quadratic, we've got linear. b might be zero, c might be zero, but if it's a quadratic, a is not zero. And the reason we're interested in the, the standard form, that's going to help us in a couple of the questions we're interested in here. One of them, the first one, where, where is the vertex? The x coordinate of the vertex is always given by negative b over 2a. So if we can identify what b is and what a is, negative b over 2a will tell us the x coordinate of the vertex. And then the y coordinate is whatever our function is at that particular value. Also, if A is opening up, or excuse me, if, if A is positive, the parabola opens up. And if A is negative, the parabola opens down. So if we know where the peak or valley is, and we'll know whether it's a peak or valley depending on whether it's opening up or down, we, we can do a, do a reasonable graph just from that information. Throw in a little bit more information, we can get an even more accurate graph. So we can, just from the equation, do a fairly quick analysis and come up with where the vertex is. The one thing we really can't do is once we know, say, where the vertex is and it's opening up, we don't know if it's opening up slowly, fairly quickly, really quickly, we, we don't know. Well, another point or two will probably help us in that. And normally the points we would plot would be the x-intercepts and the y-intercept, just because they're fairly, the y-intercept especially is fairly easy to compute. The x-intercept is often interesting for, for other reasons as well. So the x-intercept is where we cross the x-axis. And so if we think about it, it kind of works opposite of what we might think. If we're crossing the x-axis, it's the y-value that's zero. So we actually have to solve the quadratic. Now, if the quadratic was given in factored form, we should be able to easily tell where the x-intercept is. So here's one quadratic, not in this form. It's in what we call factored form. What, what's the x-intercept going to be? For the x-intercept, we need to know where y is equal to 0. And the reason the factored form is helpful for us here, for a product to be 0, one of the factors has to be 0. There's no other way to get a product of 0. So either the first factor is 0, so x has to be negative 2, or the second factor has to be 0, so x is 3. So negative 2, 0, 3, 0. That, that's two points on this parabola. So this is C here. So just because we see x plus 2, it's the x plus 2 that has to be 0. x is actually negative 2. Now I do have a worksheet where we can practice a lot of things, identifying the vertex, whether it's opening up or down, and, and different things. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll proceed. Well, in fact, let, let's finish this up a little bit more because we'd really like to know well, where's the vertex. For the vertex, we need it in this form, not the factored form. So if we use what is sometimes referred to as the FOIL technique, product of the first terms, x squared, outside, inside, and last, we get x squared minus x minus 6. So the x-coordinate of the vertex is 
is at negative b over 2a, which would be 1 half. And it turns out it's always the case, the vertex actually is always halfway between the two intercepts. If, if we find the intercepts first, the vertex will be halfway between. If we're going to have symmetry, whatever line we fold it up there is going to have to be halfway between those two, so that the two intercepts match up. Uh, the y-coordinate of the vertex, then, is what happens when we put one-half into our function, which in this case, I guess, is one-fourth minus a half, minus six, uh, minus six and a quarter. So our vertex is down here. And, and with those three points, we can do a pretty good graph of our parabola. We could also find the y-intercept when x is zero. 0, minus 0, minus 6, we can figure out the y-intercept, 0, minus 6. So we can find key, key bits of information if it starts in the factored form. If it doesn't start in the factored form, the, the vertex is a little easier to find because it will be in this form. The x-intercepts are a bit more complicated, and sometimes we can factor, or we can just jump straight to the quadratic formula. That x is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Or, or if it helps, x is equal to negative b plus or minus square root b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. That, that we can use to figure out the x-intercepts. It's also, I think, helpful to realize, notice this first part, negative b over 2a. That's the x-coordinate of the vertex. So our two x-intercepts, we move from the x-coordinate of the vertex a certain distance to the right, plus, or a certain distance, the exact same distance to the left with a minus. So if we can figure out where the vertex is, the intercepts a certain distance left and the, the, the exact same distance right, and we get our, our x-intercepts. And, and the vertex and x-intercepts is, is really enough to graph any parabola pretty accurately for our purposes. So let's look at this one. x squared plus 6x minus 9. We may start this just a little bit. It's a, a fairly involved process. So we've got x squared plus 6x minus 9 equals 0. So x is negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Inside the radical, we get what, 36 plus 36. We've got to watch our signs carefully. Now, if we were just using a calculator, square root of 72 would be fine here. And we can pull out our calculator, new negative 6, plus the square root of 72. Be sure to compute that whole numerator, divide that by 2, and similarly negative 6 minus the square root of 72, divide that by 2. Other times we want to get it in what's known as simplest radical form. Anybody remember how we simplify a square root? Because the square root of 72 is not a perfect square. We, we look for factors that are perfect squares. So 36 is a factor. 72 is 36 times 2, and we can do the square root of 36. So this does simplify a bit. And then if we simplify it a bit further, what are we going to end up with here?
we're going to cancel a 2, and ultimately that's what we want to do, we need to make sure we're canceling a common factor of a 2, or we can just look at this, say, as two fractions, negative 6 over 2, plus or minus 6 root 2 over 2, simplifies to negative 3, plus or minus 3 root 2, which is A. Those that said B didn't get the 2 canceled from the second term, only from the first. So we do have to watch as we cancel. Now, what one advantage this has for us is we, we don't have to worry as we put that in the calculator. Do we have the, the order of operations correct? Did we get the entire numerator divided by 2 or not? So we can pull out our calculator and ask it for negative 3 plus square root of 2, and actually it's plus 3 square root of 2. Because I don't know what that is exactly. We, we would, I mean, that's the exact answer. We would prefer a decimal in this case. So 1.24. About there. And then negative 3 minus that. change the entry by going to minus negative 0.724. And again, notice the first part, negative b over 2a is the first part of the quadratic formula. That's also where the vertex is. So the, the vertex here as an x-coordinate of negative 3, which my graph isn't very well done, should illustrate symmetry. And I don't have that illustrating the symmetry quite the way I'd like here. I get a little smaller as so I went to the left, counting and graphing. And if we figured out the, the x coordinate, or excuse me, the y coordinate of the vertex, negative 3 squared plus 6 times negative 3 minus 9, uh, we get minus 18. If we were careful, we'd have a pretty accurate sketch of our graph here. Once we know where the vertex is, and the two intercepts. Now, certainly with, with graphing technology, we could also just go, say, to a graphing calculator and say, well, can I just have the calculator graph this for me? This was x squared plus 6x minus 9. And have the calculator graph, but, but notice even when the calculator graphs it, if we don't have a sense of what we're looking for, you know, we don't have everything we're interested in here. We can identify the x-intercept here of 1.24, but we, we don't know the exact value. The calculator would give us an approximation. We don't know the exact value there. We certainly from this graph don't know where the vertex is. We need to adjust the window somewhat. Drop this, say, to minus 20. And the reason I knew minus 20 was okay, I'd already figured out how far down this parabola went. So there's kind of a sense, if we know where the key features are, we could get a graph that describes those key features. If we don't know where they are and we, we do our graph, you know, hopefully we'll realize I don't have all the key features. And it could be trial and error, we could figure out an appropriate window to get the key features. But a lot of times, you know, we, we'd like to know exactly where the key features are. We do have ways to do that using 
uh, an analysis of the quadratic. We can figure out exactly where the vertex is, exactly where the intercepts are. Okay. So let's try it now on, on this one. What are we going to get here if we plug into our quadratic formula and work through to solve this? I'll go ahead and start. I'll probably have to give more time. Okay, so as we plug this in, negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac, and any one of those could be negative, they could all be negative, and then over 2a. So we've got 1 plus or minus, let's see, 1 minus a negative 8 which actually does end up being a perfect square. So this is 1 plus or minus 3 over negative 2. So it's either 1 plus 3 over negative 2 or 1 minus 3 over negative 2. So we get here either negative 2 or 1, which is A. We can double check, plug it back in. Definitely have to mark the signs here. Negative 2 squared is 4. The negative then is negative 4. Minus a negative 2 is plus 2, plus another 2. Or negative 1, minus 1 is negative 2, plus 2. Both of those do give us 0. So we've got our intercepts here of negative 2 and 1. 1 over negative 2 is where the vertex would be. Not concentrated this a lot, but since A is negative, this parabola is opening down. So the vertex should be up here somewhere. So there are, there are a number of pieces that we kind of get here. All the pieces should fit together. If somehow we, we came up, say, with the vertex over here, and those two intercepts, well, that, that can't be the case. The intercepts have to be on both sides of the vertex. If we got the vertex up here, but it was supposed to be opening up, well, it is possible we can have the vertex here and it opening up, but that would be a case then where we actually would get no real solutions. So it is possible there would be no real solutions if what's inside the radical is negative. So that there are quadratics that would look like this, or like this, where we don't cross the x-axis at all. But our pieces should fit together as we, as we work through the process. Now, something else that happened in this case. If, as we go through the quadratic formula, we, we get some nice answers, 
the original quadratic would have factored. Now, in, in real world problems, probably you're not going to have a quadratic that factors nicely. So we, we'd go to the quadratic formula. But if you want to try factoring, that's fine. Here, though, the negative definitely complicates this in terms of factoring. We could factor the negative out of the entire expression and then try to factor this. We would need an x and an x to give us x squared. Let's see, a 2 and a 1 to give us minus 2. One would have to be positive, one would have to be negative. And with a little bit of thinking, I think we come up with this factorization. That would give us the minus 2, would also give us the correct uh, middle term. Minus x plus 2x would give us the correct middle term of, of x. So, uh, depending on your expertise for factoring, <coughs> factoring is a perfectly valid method to try. But in real world problems, most of the time it's probably not going to work. And so, going straight to the quadratic formula is probably a better strategy in, in the most part because it, it will always work. And if we do get square root of a negative, you may think, well, it doesn't work. But in that case, if we get the square root of a negative, we know we've got one of these two cases. We're not crossing the x-axis at all. So it worked and it gave us information. It's just the information was not where are the x-axis, uh, the x-intercepts. The information is there are no x-intercepts. So we can still get information from the quadratic formula. Actually, I think we, I did this already when we looked at this example earlier. We could have multiplied out the factored form and, and from there figured out the, the intercepts of the vertex. Uh, the, the book in this particular section doesn't do a lot finding the vertex because actually we're going to get another technique for finding the vertex uh, when we get into some calculus. So we're still very much laying the groundwork for calculus and to make sure that we're, we're comfortable with the functions we're going to deal with in calculus. Um, now, there are also times we may start with something that doesn't look like solving a quadratic equation, like x squared minus 2x equals 3. We can either factor or we can use the quadratic formula. But in this one, the first thing we do, either method we want to work with, is get it equal to zero. Your x squared minus 2x equals 3. First thing we would subtract 3 from both sides, because both factoring and the quadratic formula we have to have a quadratic equal to zero, not three. I mean, for, for some of these, we, we might be able to try a factoring technique, but in general, if you multiply two numbers to get three, it's not true that one of them has to be three. You could have six and a half, or twelve and a fourth. There are a lot of ways to get a product of three. To get a product of zero, one of the factors has to be zero. So when we're looking for the x-intercept, or even things that don't start off looking like we're looking for the x-intercept, we end up needing to solve a quadratic equation, either with factoring or the quadratic formula. So on this one, if we start trying to think of factoring this, x and x and x, I've got x plus. What are we going to need to stick in here to end up getting this factored?
you know, all the choices involve one and three. And, and if we look at this, the only way to get a three here is we have to have a one and a three somewhere. And in fact, well, they're not all. So we need a one and a three somewhere. Also, to get this to be negative, the one and three will have to be opposite signs. If they're both the same sign, if it's both plus, this would be a plus three. If it's both minus, that would be a plus three. So they have to be opposite signs. So that, that only leaves this one or this one as the possibilities. This is the one that gives us the correct middle term of minus 2x. And if it didn't give us the correct middle term, if we are really convinced that, that the only way to get this in, with one of these two choices and neither one gives us the right middle term, then we'd have to go to the quadratic formula. So not everything will factor. But this factors into x minus 3, x plus 1, or x, uh, that there'd be b there, x plus a negative 3. So we can factor that. And then once we've got the factors, we can finish it up and figure out, okay, what are our solutions or our roots to this? Solutions and roots are, are synonymous here. But we're looking to figure out wh where is this quadratic equal to zero. at 3 and negative 1. Either the first factor is 0, which happens when x is 3, or the second factor is 0, which happens when x is negative 1. example here. We've got y equals 3x squared minus 6x minus 45. First thing we want is, well, what's the x-coordinate of the vertex? In general, the x coordinate of the vertex is negative b over 2a. And the negative could go, be thought of in the numerator as with b or with the whole fraction. Where we put the negative it isn't a major concern here. So we've got uh, b is negative 6, 2a is 2 times 3. So we've got the negative of negative 6 over 2 times 3 of our choices. That, that's d. Which simplifies down then, to, I believe, just x equals 1. We finish it up. So again, we definitely have to watch our order of operations, watch our signs to come up with that. Once we have the x coordinate of the vertex, we should be able to figure out the y coordinate.
for the y coordinate, we just plug x equals 1 in our formula. 3 times 1 squared minus 6 times 1 minus 45. 3 minus 6 minus 45. We get negative 48. So we've got the vertex here at 1, negative 48. And whatever this parabola looks like, it's going to be symmetric about the line x equals 1. So if we can figure out what half of it looks like, we would know what the other half looks like as well. The y-intercept is also fairly easy to find. The y-intercept is what happens when x is 0. And if we plug in x equals 0 here, then y is 3 times 0 squared minus 6 times 0 minus 45. So up just a little bit from the vertex. And, and again, if we analyze this a little further, since A is positive, this parabola should be opening up. All the other points should be above the vertex. The vertex would be the lowest point if it's opening up. So we can fit the pieces together, and if they ever are not fitting together, well, we, we have an error somewhere. But at least it's a way to kind of check our work. Are the pieces fitting the, the way they, they should? For the x-intercepts, we need to figure out, well, where is this quadratic equal to 0? This works a little easier if we factor the 3 out first. So if we factor the 3 out, what are we going to get here? And we do get B. As we factor the 3 out, we've got to be sure to factor it out of every term. So we get an x squared, a minus 2x, and a minus 15. Now, we also could have gone straight to the quadratic formula, but, but it, it's actually a little easier here. If we see that common 3, let's go ahead and factor it out. Because then we get smaller numbers in the quadratic formula. The less simplifying we have to do there. Continue to work with this, trying to, to factor a little bit more. What are we going to get when we factor this uh, a little bit more? said B, B is correct if we do that. We've got the x squared, we've got the minus 15 as the last term, and we do get the right middle term, minus 5x plus 3x. So it does factor into x plus 3, x minus 5. And once it's factored then, the x-intercepts are x equals negative 3, and x equals 5. And from that, we, we've got a pretty good, I mean, a, enough points. We can do a pretty accurate graph. And definitely from this, from the graph, we can tell what, where this function is decreasing, where it's increasing, uh, where, where it levels <coughs> out. 
So with the quadratic, there are a number of things we're interested in that we can do just from analyzing the function itself and looking for the vertex and the zeros. As our functions get more complicated, we're going to want to do the same kind of analysis. Where is our function decreasing? Because that would help us graph it. Where is it increasing? That would help us graph it. But as the functions get more complicated, it's a lot harder to figure out exactly where those peaks and valleys are. Um, you know, quadratic just has a peak or a valley and just one, and we've got a way to figure it out. More complicated functions, it's more complicated, and that will be one of our goals of calculus is to well, what can we do as the functions get more complicated? Let's see. Jump and make sure. Yeah, I, I think I kind of assimilated many of the examples earlier in the lecture, so I think we're fine. Your, your assignment for 1.5 for is uh, posted on Blackboard. And we've gotten everything covered with that. And we'll see you then Tuesday.